So here we are. It's uh, October 2024. And this, I've just attended um, this one day assembly, a circuit assembly with the representative from the local Bethel, in this case in England. Not ashamed of the good news, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Now I'm going to cover the morning session, which is why Jehovah's Witnesses are not ashamed of preaching the good news, taking a stand. Uh, that would include uh, a stand that has to be taken with people who are unfriendly or that where there's persecution. Being a workman with nothing to be ashamed of, showing the power spirit of power love and soundness of mind so that's what i'm covering there was one other talk in the morning and that was the baptism talk where two were baptized the audience um, was around about a thousand just over a thousand jehovah's witnesses meeting in this circuit assembly so uh, this sticker is not in connection with the assembly i just fancy putting it on um, and this is just for the blue light. So why are Jehovah's Witnesses not ashamed of the good news? Romans chapter uh, 1 verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the good news. It is in fact God's power for salvation. And the speaker highlighted the point that there may be, may be many situations where Jehovah's Witnesses find themselves where they hesitate to speak. They show a bit of a shame. Uh, this is a natural inclination. There are times when people say things and you don't want to say anything and you just stay quiet. Uh, someone may bring up a subject that, oh, what the world is coming to? What's going to happen next? No, I don't think there's a future. And Jehovah's Witnesses would normally attempt to preach to them, you see, or witness to them uh, appropriately. Um, and yet sometimes we stay quiet. Sometimes we feel, oh, I, don't wanna, I just don't want to say anything. And this is an understandable feeling, whether you're at school, you're at work, or um, you're in the public ministry, or you're informally witnessing, perhaps in a, in a park bench or in a queue or something. So the point was that Paul was said he was not ashamed of the good news and then he says and this links in with the next talk he says it is in fact god's power for salvation to everyone having faith to the greek first so the jew first because they were the first ones to receive christ and the message from the apostles the christian message and then it was the greeks those people in the mediterranean world who were not of the jewish faith who eventually adopted Christianity. Not that Christians were always popular. So the next point was a look at the scripture in Corinthians. I should put this in the subtitles. So in Corinthians, we've got 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 21 to 23. It says here, for since in the... For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not get to know God through its wisdom. God was pleased with the foolishness of what is preached to save those believing. Now, the world, the last thing that people in the, in the community around Jehovah's Witnesses, the last thing most of them think is that they don't want to listen to the message. This message, in fact, they view the message... Not just as foolish, but uh, presented and brought to them by foolish people. In other words, they look down upon them. Both religious Christians look down upon the message of Jehovah's Witnesses, as well as others who consider themselves superior, such as those who are perhaps atheists. Then he says this, he says, For the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ executed on a stake, or some say cross. To the Jews a cause for stumbling, but to the nation's foolishness. Now there's a scripture in the Mosaic law that says 
A person who is hung on a stake is accursed. They are an accursed criminal. The last person you would follow is a criminal. And so the early Christians were following a Jew who died as a criminal. A criminal's death was found guilty in a court of law, in the highest court of, of law in Israel. So they felt that they were following a foolish man. Jesus was not considered uh, as people talk about him today. And to the Greeks, well, the behaviour of Christians was foolish. So the message was rejected. So that was the point of that. Now, Romans 11, 13, it mentions a lovely little point here, if I've got it. 11, 13, this is in the online Bible. It says this, it says, Now I speak to you who are people of the nations. Seeing that I am an apostle to the nations, I glorify my ministry. The people of the nations would have been the Greeks and those living in the Mediterranean area, including the Romans. Notice he says that I glorify my ministry. Now, the reference point on this is, or magnify my ministry, often used in connection with glorifying God. In this context, the verb may contain such shades of meaning as take pride, take pride, take seriousness, make the most of. Paul shows that he highly esteems his ministry, regarding it as honour of the highest magnitude. So, so appreciating the privilege we've got of sharing this marvellous message that Jesus gave us about his love and his father. So what an honour. And of course, Jesus talks about his ministry as the most important task that he had when he came to earth. And he set that example to his apostles. So that's um, not being ashamed of the good news. The next talk was called um, Taking a Stand for the Good News. Now, Taking a Stand for the Good News, we have... Uh, the the speaker for this mentioned about getting pride in successfully accomplishing something like passing an exam. He mentioned the driving test. You're so happy that you've passed, you let everybody know and you celebrate. And he said, that's the same feeling we should have with the honour of preaching the good news. He says, do you feel that way? <laughs> he said, just think of you as a mother. You've gone... You've spent hours making a very special meal. All your family come down and eat it. And then they rush off back to their computers, uh, social media. They don't even say thank you. How would you feel? Now this can happen to Jehovah's Witnesses. When they're out in the preaching work, they've gone to all that effort. They may go out for hours. Get no, gra no, great, no gratitude. But he says, someone can see the hard work that that mother has done. For her family and he's up there even if at times they forget to show appreciation themselves so that was the main point now Matthew chapter 10 was mentioned so Matthew 10 32 everyone then who acknowledges me before men I will acknowledge him before my father who is in the heavens so that shows that Jesus is so appreciative when we glorify our ministry to others. He's so appreciative that he passes that glorification on to his father and says, look at what they're doing. So they appreciate it. So that's a lovely thought. And the other scripture was Romans. So here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and exercise faith in your heart that God raised him up from the dead you will be saved so if you want to be saved and you're a Christian what do you need to do if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord publicly declare preaching the good news as Jesus did and his faithful apostles so that's the conclusion of that talk um, standing up for the good news so the next talk was taken by our local circuit overseer the first talk was taken by the 
uh, branch representative. The second, uh, the third talk here is taken, given by the circuit overseer. That's uh, an elder who visits the congregations and upbuilds them twice every year. So a workman with nothing to be ashamed of. So if you're a workman, what do you pride your mo the most in your work? Have a look. Second Timothy chapter two, verse chapter two, verse fifteen. It says, "Do your utmost to present yourself approved to God, a workman with nothing to be ashamed of, handling the word of truth aright." So, preaching the good news is the same as being a workman. Do you take pride in your work? And what does a workman have that's really, really important? A good set of tools. So you need really good tools. What's the most important tool that a Christian can have? The Holy Word of God, the Bible. So you need to know how to use it, handle the word of truth aright. He, the, this speaker, he talked about having a work evaluation. And uh, it said here, if you wrote your own work evaluation, how would you feel? So if you're at work or at school, college, you work your own evalu evaluation. Because at the end of each semester, you get a report, don't you? You get a school report, a college report, that tells you what you need to work on. And uh, the circuit overseer jokingly said, they said that if you worked as well as you speak, you'd do really well. So in other words, he had the gift of the gab, but didn't quite live up to it. So what is our evaluation? How would you evaluate what you're doing for God? He said, imagine there was an emergency in your household and you need to phone. So you phoned 999 and they sent round an ambulance and out of the ambulance got out two 80-year-olds, 80-year-olds who struggled to get out of the ambulance, <laughs> paramedics to come and see you. And they said, oh, the last time I had, a, had a, 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 an evaluation, it was 60 years ago, still got the same tools. How confident would you feel about being <laughs> cared for? Would you say, oh, well, carry on then? Or would you go, my God, these people? So that was the illustration he, he used. <laughs> and then he said, praise. He said the most important thing to have, the first point was praise. David praised his father in Psalm 9, verse 12. It says, praise God. He said, this praise is the key point in loving God. If you love God, you will praise him. And that's the first motivator to share your faith with others. The second point is the topic. We all like a nice topic, don't we? It, if you, for example, he used the illustration of a football team. You see, once you get a few football team members together, or if you're in a sewing class, or you arrange flowers, or you work in your garden, you love talking about what, what you're good at, what you enjoy doing. You never stop talking. So he says, develop that love for the preaching of the good news, and then you will share it with others happily. So it's the message. And the topic that we have as Christians is a wonderful new world where there will be no more suffering or pain anymore. The third point he, he mentions was what Jesus did. You see, Jesus was the, God's only son in heaven. He's the top person of God's creation in the whole universe. And he allowed himself to be his life to be taken away and made into a little embryo in the womb of a woman to live in that woman to grow up and become a teenager as he grew up he had to put up with the people around him the imperfect people around him and then he got older he then demonstrated that wonderful love to his disciples and his women followers 
and then he was treated like a criminal and killed in the worst possible way about as, a, as, as an accursed criminal in the Jewish law. Why did he do such a thing? It says because he loved us. He loved the human race so much that he's willing to do that. And the fourth point. The fourth point in this is love of people. Now this is one of the points that we might struggle with because loving people, you know, they're hard to love. They're horrible, aren't they? Um, so he made a very point, a very important point here. He says, why not love the people who listen? So you've got a motive. When I go out and talk to people, I'll, I'll develop a love and a friendship with those who listen. But to do that, you've got to search for them. And so you have to meet everybody. So that makes you demonstrate love for a stranger who may not be very friendly because you're looking for the ones who are will listen. <laughs> so. And uh, so he summed up the point that it's very important that you have to have the, the right motivations. You have to have the right equipment. And he highlighted to Jehovah's Witnesses that the equipment includes the guides that we have about loved people. There's a brochure that has helped Jehovah's Witnesses to preach their ministry better. And he said, become familiar with it and use it in your ministry. So that was the other point. So that's talk number three. The workman has nothing to be ashamed of. And the final talk after the song and announcements was uh, showing the spirit of power, love and soundness of mind. And that includes the worries about persecution. Uh, letter of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 7. It says, For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but one of power and of love and soundness of mind. So we do not become ashamed, either of the witness about our Lord. And then he mentions himself as a prisoner. So when he wrote this, he was a prisoner in Rome. Now, he had reason to write about cowardice and this these views he was locked in a prison cell in Rome now there were lots of prisons and at the time Christians were banned so in Rome if you were a Christian and caught by the authorities you were in the arena or you were imprisoned and the Apostle Paul or Saint Paul as the Catholics call him that he was in prison because he'd appealed to Caesar because he was a Roman citizen so because he'd done that he wasn't put in the arenas. He wasn't caught and killed. He was awaiting trial. But his Christian, the Christians in Rome were not able to locate him. Uh, but a man from Ephesus, which is in, in the area of Greece, had travelled in. Maybe he was a trader or something. Anyway, he was a Christian. Now his, man, his name was, and I'm going to pronounce this properly wrong, Oenaris. Now, this man, um, Owen Aris, um, he travelled in and he managed to locate, locate the Apostle Paul in prison. Now, he'd been isolated on his own, so it was hugely encouraging to him. So... He says... He says, Paul says, as I remember your tears, I'm longing to see you, that I may get filled with joy. And then he talked about the spirit of cowardice. He says, uh, for me, a prisoner, for Jesus' sake, but take your part in suffering adversity for the good news by relying on the power of God. He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of works, um, and then he mentions who visited him. And this man, uh, Onias, in, uh, in, in verse 17 of chapter 1, he says, On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he diligently looked for me and found me. 
May the Lord grant him mercy in the in that day. And as you well know, all the services he rendered in Ephesus. So this man from Ephesians, uh, Ephesus had found Paul and started to really encourage him. And whenever he was in Rome, he went in, saw him and encouraged him. And once Paul had been found, other Christians found him. Those who were not known to the authorities. And so Paul was visited by others as well. And that really encouraged him. And what the audience was encouraged to do, what we were encouraged to do, was be like this, this Christian. So, and he just finished it with, um, so the Apostle Paul was refreshed by this wonderful brotherly love. And we can demonstrate that love to our fellow Christians as well, can't we? So that was the summary of the morning's um, service and we just finished on this scripture here proverbs 17 verse 17 he says a true friend shows love at all times and is a brother who is born for times of distress so someone who comes and helps you when you really need that help what a wonderful thing. So that was the summary of the morning's events at this assembly. So it, they covered not to be ashamed of the good news because it's an honour, a huge honour from God and his dear son. And you're following in the footsteps of the faithful Christians of the past and the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And then we were told to take a stand, being proud to have the honour of preaching the good news and then being a workman, using the equipment and taking pride in the job that you're honoured to have. And then, of course, the showing the spirit of power, love and soundness of mind. Now, these, these uh, circuit assemblies, they uh, occur twice a year for the congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses and Jehovah's Witnesses will travel to them. Some who are not able to travel are able to watch these things on the Zoom facility, on, online, on the internet. Um, so, that's my coverage of this morning's uh, uh, assembly. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. And there will be a part two for the afternoon, I hope. Thank you and take care. May God uh, bless you.